I used to be at the University of Chicago, which famously has always been a really good school. But when I was a kid, you know, I was looking at what universities to go to, it was not a high ranked school in the traditional ranking. So they very explicitly invoked a new policy to get a whole bunch of people to apply who so just so they could reject them. And mm. nothing changed about the university or its student body, but they skyrocketed up the rankings. And that's gaming the system. I want to talk about, you know, kind of your perspective now that you, I mean, your position at Caltech, you were advising students and so forth. But now you're, you know, you're officially a professor, as I understand it, in terms of, you know, the typical responsibilities and, and, and it's rightfully suits you um, uh, delightfully well. Um, but I want to ask about, you know, college seems to me to be coming more and more of what I call the academic hunger games. I mean, first you're like fighting to get people, you know, to be uh, seen in, in high school and, and get into these places. They brag about rejecting, you know, at, at, you know, one of my alma maters, you know, 97 percent of the people that apply. These are like things that they brag about. And, you know, to what extent is it really becoming a luxury, a luxury brand and these colleges uh, should be maybe treated differently. And I know uh, Bloomberg has given a lot to, to Hopkins and the, there's other uh, ways that have made it more affordable, but it's still, I mean, I, I heard from your, you know, one of the places you, you used to work at MIT, they could turn away, they could accept like 10 more classes worth of students based on quality alone. In other words, they're turning away tremendous numbers of qualified applicants. What's going on here? What, why is it that our discipline, being a professor, uh, physics or whatever, um, really hasn't changed in, thousand years, at least the last 50 years after, after, you know, a thousand years of basically having this model where you have the sage on a stage, you know, as our mutual friend, David Kaiser says, you know, one guy is scratching with a rock on another piece of a rock and, and they're all looking up in rapt attention. Um, our profession hasn't changed substantially, at least maybe in a hundred years, but maybe a thousand years since the university of Bologna opened its doors in 1080. Um, I wonder, you know, how many other industries can survive like this? I mean, it's great. We're doing outreach. We're doing, you know, demonstrations. I do kind of live stuff on my show. Uh, but, you know, I'm more, you and I are kind of rare and you inspired me to do it. So there's not like maybe that many people that you can inspire to actually do it that are faculty. I believe I should say that faculty have a moral obligation to to give back to the public in some way. But let's let's uh, let's not talk about that. Education. Uh, what's wrong? Maybe you don't think anything's wrong, but but I feel like it's become a luxury brand that we kind of are proud of the fact that we turn away more, you know, 30 times more than we could substantially educate. Well, I think that there's a whole bunch of things going on here at once. And the first thing I should say is I am not a professional at thinking about how to improve the state of education. I'm a professional educator, but there are people who actually study how you can do it better. And there are people who think very hard about education policy and how we can make the flow of money more equitable, things like that. And I'm not such a person. So I'm just bloviating right now about how things should work. Take it for what it is worth. Um, and I do think that there are things changing. I mean, here we are on a podcast, right? Which couldn't have existed a hundred years ago. So um, there are videos, there are online courses. I always encourage people to take really good online courses and MOOCs and so forth. Wondrium uh, makes courses. I'm doing yet another course with them. So there's more opportunities out there. But I think you're, you know, you're right, pointing at the sort of standard issue higher education paradigm. Um, there are flaws in it, absolutely. Absolutely. You know, I used to be at the University of Chicago, which famously has always been a really good school. But when I was a kid, you know, I was looking at what universities to go to. It was not a high ranked school in the traditional rankings. And part of that was because they accepted a huge number of applicants percentage wise. And the reason for that was just that no one would apply to the University of Chicago unless they were already really, really good and, you know, wanted to go to the University of Chicago. But that is not a way to get up there in the rankings. So they very explicitly invoked a new policy to get a whole bunch of people to apply who so just so they could reject them. And mm. nothing changed about the university or its student body, but they skyrocketed up the rankings. And that's gaming the system in a, you know, a very transparent way. And 
well, why would it work? You know, why would people care about that? And a lot of this is is questions for employers and parents and students. You know, why do they care what the ranking of your school is? I mean, I remember running into someone uh, who was a young student who was going to go to law school, and I said, "Well, where do you want to go to law school?" And they said, "I don't care. Just you know, one of the top five schools, right?" <laughs> and well, that that just rubs me the wrong way. It's not what it should be about. But then there's also issues of you know the how we pay for it, right? And there, I think that things have changed a lot. I mean, in, you know, again, in my day, it seems that university educations are a lot more affordable than they are now. And a lot of it seems, and I say seems, because again, I'm not an expert here. It seems to me that universities have learned that they can make a lot of money by charging an exorbitant tuition, but then just letting all their students get loans to pay it back. So they're really sort of getting money from the future of their students, which is great for the university, not so good for the students. And so I think that the student debt burden is enormous and really, really bad. Yeah. If we lower it, uh, you know, maybe universities will suffer a little bit and maybe they should suffer a little bit. Uh, I, I don't want them to suffer, but it's a weird um, system. And, you know, throw in also the fact that public support for public education has cratered. You know, states used to support their own state universities to a level they just don't anymore. And, and I think that California, for example, where you are at a state university is probably better than most, but still not nearly as good as it used to be, right? In terms of affordability to the average student. So, and then you have the issue of, you know, what is the best pedagogical method? Is it just a, you know, one person at one end of a log and the other person at the other end talking to each other? Uh, what about flipped classrooms and active learning? You know, there's a, just a million issues that we could talk about, none of which I'm really an expert in. I mean, <laughs> part of me is just a dinosaur. And I think that there's nothing better than a bunch of people sitting around a table talking. And you know, one of them is the professor and some of them are the students, but they're all trying to learn a little bit. And, and that's what I'll be doing in both of my classes this fall. So I love lecturing when it's appropriate, but you know, a good seminar where we can all talk about things is really, to me, the pinnacle of the university experience. Yeah, it's right up there with the sabbatical. Um, <laughs> but no, I, I, I really, I tend to agree with you. And I also think that, you know, in the case of at least private institutions, you know, the question of why are they tax exempt organizations? Why do they have to, why does, you know, uh, Princeton or Stanford brag about, you know, having a $50 billion endowment that grew 30% during or 15% during the global pandemic, uh, if they're not going to spend it. And then they're still, you know, soliciting people like me for donations, uh, you know, as alumni, and they have this vast network, you know, so you take out a loan to go there, uh, the government slash your, and you can't discharge it in bankruptcy. Uh, so these, these, you know, they operate kind of like hedge funds. I mean, that's their, their primary role is to, is the sustenance of the entity here. You know, I always joke, like, how do I distinguish what I do at UCSD versus UCLA? Uh, you know, do I know some special brand of physics? You know, do I know the the fourth Newton's law? You know, do I, is there some other thing I can add to the to the uh, oeuvre of physics? No, I, absolutely. It's, Harvard doesn't know more than than uh, Johns Hopkins or San Diego. So they tend to now distinguish it based on perks. You know, like this dorm, you know, on campus near my office has an ocean view. Well, that's pretty nice. Or there's a rock climbing wall. Or there's a, a gym. Uh, or there's a cafeteria with fresh, you know, sushi or whatever. Um, so that seems to me to be getting really far away from the, you know, sitting on a log and 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 scratching rocks and other rocks to 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 map out a picture. Um, yeah, I, I am. I, I agree. There there is a beauty to the to the old way of doing things. Uh, it did, you know, some things have just been successful for thousands of years, and there's a reason for it. Uh, but. I do think things like virtual, you know, learning, augmented reality. I mean, you're a wonderful teacher, Sean, but, you know, if I got to sit down with Plato and, you know, and he was like sitting there in the room with me uh, <clears throat> and uh, or with Einstein, that'd be pretty good. I actually got, you know, the collected works of, of Galileo. And for the first time with Carlo Rovelli, your friend Carlo and others, we made an audio book called the, the Dialogue on the Two World Systems, where he and I narrate it with another Italian physicist. Uh, Carlo and uh, Fabiola Giannotti reads Galileo's introduction and Frank Wilczek reads Einstein's introduction. But I started to think, Sean, well, now I've got a million words of Galileo. It takes 21 hours to listen to the whole darn thing. Um, and, you know, well, what if I put it into GPT-3? Uh, would you get out a convincing, you know, simulacrum of Galileo? And if you did, could you 
use that in an educational framework. Do you, have you thought about, you know, where AI could go, where my, my handy device behind me could go uh, in the future of education? Yeah, I mean, I think that we're nowhere close to anything like that. Uh, of course, you could put a whole large corpus of any one person into GPT-3 or any other AI program and get something out that would sound a lot like them because it is just their words slightly rearranged, right? I mean, that's not really very surprising to me. But then as soon as you start asking questions out of context, uh, it's easy to see that it has no insight, it has no understanding. And I'm not someone who thinks that it couldn't have insight or understanding, but uh, the optimization problem that is being solved right now is for cheap tricks, <laughs> is for things that look good and slick and will amaze you without having that deeper understanding. So right. someday we'll have that deeper understanding and that'll be great. And then everyone will have their personal physics tutor and that'll be wonderful. But it's not, you know, something that I'm worried about uh, in terms of my own job security. <laughs>